The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. What are the essential elements of the gospel? Are there some things that we should be dogmatic about? Was Jesus ever dogmatic about the gospel? How can we stay away from confusion? This is Grace in Focus. We are so glad that you've tuned in today. We come to you from the Grace Evangelical Society, a free grace nonprofit organization. Find out more about us at faithalone.org. We have thousands of articles we've written at that website and other resources that you will be interested in. That's faithalone.org. Now with today's question and answer discussion, here are Bob Wilkin and Ken Yates. Ken, I've got a question here from Jonathan, and this is kind of a follow-up to a question we just had from uh, Brittany. And Jonathan says, most Christians believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They trust that he is their substitutionary sacrifice for their sins. They believe he is God manifested in the flesh who takes our sin and imputes in them his perfect righteousness. But very few of them are believing in him for the gift of everlasting life. It is assumed as a direct result of them believing in him alone by faith alone, not trusting in any works whatsoever to be added as some sort of merit. I'm not sure exactly what Jonathan means there, but I'm thinking he's saying that even though the person doesn't believe in the gift of everlasting life, it's assumed they do because they're believing that their initial salvation anyway is by faith apart from works. So you're saved by grace, but you got to keep doing works to keep it or something like that. Sounds like that's what Jonathan's sure. saying. Right. And then he goes on, however, y'all confuse people by insisting on them believing in Christ for everlasting life in order for them to be born again. So we're confusing people. You have essentially gutted the gospel narrative. (laughs) That's strong words. Gutted the gospel narrative with such an overly dogmatic position. Um, Was the Lord overly dogmatic when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father but by me? That's pretty dogmatic, isn't it? Or when he said to the woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God and who it was to speak to, the gift is eternal life. Right. So he said, you need to know this. Right. Right. Is that being overly dogmatic? Well, he goes on, please correct this misguided error. (laughs) As I enjoy listening to y'all for the most part and have purchased many of y'all's books, it just hurts my heart that you confuse people on this issue when it is unnecessary. Now, Abraham loved God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham Uh, loved God? He says beloved. I think he means believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham wasn't believing in God for everlasting life. Oh, really? Why did uh, the Lord Jesus say in John 8, 56, Abraham rejoiced to see my day? And why does the author of Hebrews say, that Abraham was looking forward to the new Jerusalem. In the, in How the could new he heaven, be? Right, in the eternal state. Right. How could he be looking forward to that if he didn't know he was going to be there? He was just kind of wishful thinking there. And how could Paul say in Romans 4, 1 through 4, that Abraham was justified before God by faith apart from works? How can he use him as an example of that if Abraham didn't believe he was justified? You know, it's interesting, even here, and this may be a small point, but in his opening part of his question, it's Jonathan. Right. He says people believe in the death, if I heard you correctly, death, burial, and resurrection. Well, others would say, well, that's not enough. You got to believe in his deity as well. So you can see that even what he's saying, there's people who don't believe assurance is of the essence of saving faith. But they would disagree with what he just said. Oh, know, right. You know, that, oh, no, that's not enough. you got to believe that he's the second person of the Trinity or, or whatever. There was a whole big brouhaha that happened where some people were saying, well, you've got to believe in the deity, the death, and the resurrection. Then there were other people that came along and said, you must also believe in the burial. 
And they were saying that people who said you could simply believe that Jesus is deity, death, and resurrection, but you don't have to believe in his burial, they called that a groundless gospel. Right. <laughs> so you got crossless gospel, you groundless got a groundless <laughs> gospel. And then they called our position the promise only gospel, which it was never a promise only gospel, it's a promise bullseye gospel. <laughs> How do we get to believe the bullseye? Well, through believing that Jesus has made us savable through what he did on the cross, right? Right. He has taken away our sins so that when we believe in him, we have everlasting life. But let's stop and think more about what Jonathan is saying and what Brittany was saying. Ultimately, what they're saying is essentially... Just about everybody in Christianity is born again, right? And even the cults. Now, they, they might, I don't know, Brittany and, and Jonathan's case, they may say, no, no, no. But even the cults believe what they say, or many of the cults do. Well, they would they would draw the line and say, wait a minute, their view of the deity of Christ is defective. Well, but notice the way he worded it, the death, burial, and resurrection. Right. But well, he did go on to talk about the deity of Christ, right. because he did go on to say they believe he is God all caps, God, Mm -hmm. manifested in the flesh. So, but again, Mormons believe Jesus is God. Jehovah's Witnesses believe Jesus is God. Now they have a very defective view of this. You know, if you're going to draw that line, then ultimately you're going to be undercutting the assurance of most people because how accurate is their belief in the deity of Christ? Or And particularly when they first believed. Right. How many, when you believed... What did you believe about the deity of Christ? Were you orthodox in that belief? Just jumping in here to make you aware of our magazine, Grace in Focus. It is a bi-monthly, six issues per year, 48-page magazine, full color. And we want you to subscribe by emailing your name and your snail mail address to ges at faithalone.org. The subscription is free. It can be accessed electronically or it can be actually physically sent to you if you live in the lower 48 United States. That's our Grace and Focus magazine. Send your name and snail mail address to ges at faithalone.org. I'll give you an example. I was speaking at a church in Starkville, Mississippi. And afterwards, a young man came up who had graduated from Mississippi State. He had come to faith through the pastor of the church. And the pastor and I were sitting there talking a little bit. And the young man came up and said, Pastor, I came to faith in Christ through you, and I'm so thankful. Pastor, that's great. And he said, but do you know that when I came to faith in Christ, I believe Jesus is the Son of God? And the pastor goes, that's right, he is. He said, no, I believed he was the Son of God. (laughs) I believed that God had a child through normal bodily function, and that this child was Jesus, and Jesus became God. At that point, but well, he how, didn't exist. How heretical that. is that, right? right. <laughs> and the pastor said, Well, that's terrible. And he was like, Yeah, but I came to understand that Jesus has eternally been the Son of God and had nothing to do with his birth in Bethlehem. He was the Son of God eternally. And the pastor goes, That's right. But I didn't believe that when I was born again. Well, how many people are like that? Now, of course, that's it's got to be that's unbelievably a Mor- that's a high. Mormon view of right. the deity of Christ, sure. right? But this guy wasn't Mormon. This guy was in a Bible church, and he believed that. Well, how many people, when they come to faith, they can say, "I believe Jesus is the Son of God," but they don't really have a clue what that means. Exactly, they and use the terminology. How about with children? Are you going to tell me that a ten-year-old understands about the virgin birth? and a 10-year-old understands about the eternality of Jesus, that Jesus has always existed? I mean, the point is, you can make it to where, ultimately, assurance becomes a very tenuous thing, because how do you know your grasp of the deity of Christ is sufficient? Now, of course, that's not exactly what Jonathan's going after. What he's going after is the idea you don't have to believe that it's secure. But ultimately what that's saying is there's no need to evangelize anybody in Christianity. Just go out to non-Christians and talk to them. But don't talk to Catholics. Don't talk to Orthodox. Don't talk to the people who believe in work salvation because they're all cool. Right. Because most of them believe that salvation began by faith apart from works. In fact, some of them, like people who believe in baptismal regeneration, believe it started by infant baptism 
apart from faith or works. Oh, they might say you had an implicit faith, right? Something sure. Something like that. But That's a good point. Would they believe then that someone who was baptized as a baby, who then believes in the death, burial, and resurrection, but is looking at that baptism and say, well, yeah, I'm saved because I was baptized and I believe Jesus died for my sins, or I believe that he was, uh, you know, of course, I have to keep doing good works. Very confused gospel. But once you say you've got to do anything to retain your salvation— then you do not believe John 3.16. You do not believe John 11.26. You do not believe Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You don't believe Acts 16.31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You now believe that it takes more than faith in Christ to have an irrevocable salvation. What you get in Christ is probation. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right? what you get. You get a good start. And in the same way, people can say, well, believing in Jesus is a good start. But now do your part. Right. Work hard the rest of your life. Persevere to the end. Now, I'm scheduled to do a marathon, and I'm training for it. Yesterday I did five miles. Last weekend I did 10. The weekend before that I did 16. I'm supposed to do 18 this weekend. We'll see. But hopefully in a month I'm going to do this marathon. It's not an automatic that I'm going to finish it. I've completed 10. One I didn't. One I went 10 miles and stopped. But I've completed 10 marathons. I hope this will be my 11th. But the truth is there's no guarantees. I could get hurt. I can get sick. It, you know, lots of things can happen along the way. But the thing is, in terms of the Christian life, it's much harder than a marathon. I mean, the Christian life is, I came to faith at 20. I'm now 71. That's 50 years, 51 years. I may live in then my mom lived in 96. I may live another 25, 30 years. If I do, I'm called to persevere, right? Right. And you don't know if you're going to do that. There's no, no guarantee of that. The right. Bible doesn't give me that guarantee. But what it does give me a guarantee is that since I'm one of the whoever's who believes in him, I'm never going to perish. I have ever like one I'll end with this. I know we're out of time. One of my favorite songs when I was at, I was an intern at First Baptist Dallas in the high school department, and Dr. Criswell was the pastor, and we used to sing this song, Whosoever Surely Meaneth Me. I love that song, and I still love it. It's true, and I stand on that, and we all do. All of us who know that we have everlasting life by faith in Christ stand on the promise of the free gift of everlasting life. And until we meet again, keep, keep grace. grace. In focus. We would love to know where you are when you are listening to us. Please take a short minute to send us the call letters of this station and the city where you are listening and how many times a week you listen. Thank you. You will be helping us with our stewardship. Send it to radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. We are so thankful for our financial partners who keep us on the air. Every gift is tax deductible and very much appreciated. If you'd like to find out how you can give, go to faithalone.org. On our website, we have a church tracker. It's an easy to use map that will help you locate those other Free Grace churches that might be in your area. So come visit us at the website and take advantage of our free church tracker. It's at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. On our next episode in the book of Romans, does Paul equate forgiveness and justification? Hope you'll join us for that. And until then, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.